I didn't change my, I call it broom. Yeah. I didn't change my broom much, but the warlock that moved here went and worked right where my husband worked. Well, see, mm -hmm. me, I don't. I mean, I, right. that's my natural way. All, all up the outer banks, mostly every place talks different. That's right. Other people do have, have a different broom. <laughs> yeah. In the summer, Ocracoke is a thriving tourist area, alive and jumping with thousands of vacationers who come to enjoy the pristine beauty of the island. But in the winter, Ocracoke is just another small town in North Carolina, or so the 700 people who live here year-round think. It's home and it's special to me because it's home. We found this place and it was beautiful. Ocracoke's quite simply a uh, magical place, uh, magical in the very uh, keenest senses of the word and in as much as it teaches you to appreciate things, you learn here, but you learn by an appreciation for uh, just how nice a uh, sunny day or a bit of sky or a little, uh, you know, a tuft of uh, sea oats out there on a dune, whatever it is, um, turns your attention and that's what changes uh, people, I think, when they come here. I guess a good thing, you know, to know that I was born and raised right here and one of the original ones when, before people started moving in as tourists and stuff, you know. And it just feels good to know that, you know, I'm gonna, you might send an original Okokoker, <laughs> you know, Okokoker. So I can't say that I have a, uh, true appreciation for what to be an Ococker is, but I have a great respect for it. Well, to really, really and truly, you, know, you got to be born and raised and lived in Ococker. That makes you an Ococker. You're a native. Ococoke, located in the North Carolina Outer Banks, is an unusual place because it is so isolated from the rest of North Carolina. It takes either a 45-minute ferry ride from Cape Hatteras or a two-and-a-half-hour ride across the Pamlico Sound to get on or off the island. The language of Ocracoke has grown very distinct because of this isolation. In fact, isolation is one of the reasons the original inhabitants came to the island. Some of the early settlers that perhaps came into Virginia first in the 16 to 1700s, and a number of them were folks straight out of the debtor's prison. Now today, that wouldn't mean a whole lot. You know, you'd have to lock 95% of the country up if you, you know, if you, if you, you wanted to get at all the people in debt, you know, with the credit card situation. But back then, if you, if you owed 10 pounds and, you know, you're thrown into prison. So a lot of those folks were so disgusted with government that they wanted to get, a, you know, as far away from civilization as they could get or any form of government. So they left Jamestown. You know, they left Williamsburg and, and trickled on down there to be out, you know, on their own. As a result, the Ocracoke dialect, or brogue, has many distinctive features that set it apart from other North Carolina dialects. These are pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammatical differences. When people are isolated for one reason or another, either because of the mountains or because of water, then they often will retain some features of older English. An example of a grammatical difference is the use of the word weren't, where other English speakers use wasn't. I heard some footsteps. They weren't me and they weren't Linda. I heard some footsteps. They weren't a the dog because the dog was sitting the, near the beach near the water. Another highly noticeable feature of the brogue is the pronunciation of words like tire and fire. Well, we toured it on the side of the week. Last night, the water fire, night moonshine, no fish. We spoke matter of woods. <laughs> now, <laughs> now tell me what you said. <laughs> uh, high tide on the uh, sound high side. High tide on the sound side, yeah. Last night, the water fire. Water fired? Yeah, that's phosphorus in the water. You ever, okay, you ever go to yeah. the ocean, you see the, last well, the old people fired. used to call it uh, water fire, water when the water fire yeah. fired. Last night, water fired. Okay. Yeah, and the night, the moonshine. And, and, night it, and the night the moonshine, so they had one night they had a water fire against them, the next night they had a moonshine, moonshine. to get them. 
Another example of a pronunciation difference is the unique pronunciation of the I vowel sound in words like high and tide. You usually can't catch, you know, couldn't catch too much on bright nights. You know, yeah. when the nights are bright, right. you don't catch much fish. So I see, I see. So, uh, <laughs> so that's why, felt, so they who, when they went out there, you know, they've been fishing for two nights, still hadn't uh, uh, caught no fish. So we went to this other other, other old guy and said, last night water far, night high tide on the sign side. Last night water far, night moonshine, no fish. What do you suppose, my uncle Woods? <laughs> One of the biggest differences is the choice of words that they use on Ocracoke. Are you sick in the gut? Like you're sick in the gut, have a stomachache? Yeah, that's like, just like bilious. That's when your stomach's... Oh, really? Yeah, yeah that's stomach. Yeah. Oh, it's I think I think it's really just probably yeah, coming from the word queasy or something. Queasy, you know. What I hear it say is bilious or... or, uh, or uh, Quamish. Yeah. I still say it. Okay. I feel a little Quamish from the stomach, you know. A little bit sick stomach. Feel like you're gonna have a sick stomach or Well, qualm is just sort of like sick, a little bit, you know, your stomach's not feeling too good, something like that. As far as I understand. That's when he's laying on the deck green. <laughs> yeah. You're shoving over the side when you're qualmish. At one time it was the Elite, which was the mail boat that would come in. And uh, and the mail would come in, they would everybody would meet down to the to say Jack's dock and the boat would come in and dock and, and every, the whole crowd knew it and they knew that this particular time the mail was coming in and everybody met down there and they'd somebody would stand right there and they'd hold a, a letter up and they'd holler and holler the name on it, Ganagasco, Lum! And they'd holler at the, over the village, you know, and over everybody that was out there. And if you weren't there, then somebody would catch you. They weren't, they weren't like it is today, you know. If you weren't there, your neighbor carried to you. It wasn't a big deal, you know. It's, and it's uh, funny now, a lot of the older ones and stuff, like I noticed Clinton and different of the older ones and like Chloe and them, like at 1 o'clock, they'll go at the post office and they'll wait and sit there for half an hour, hour for the lady, you know, the postmistress to put the mail in the box. There's plenty of good short language that comes up on an okra coat, I think, for describing things. I think the language is a very useful language. It's easier to talk that way. Just hiding and finding it and running through the bushes and hide somewhere else. And hollering, me hawking, me hawking, they know you wherever you are. Where they got that name? No, I don't know. It's really just another name. It's sort of like hiding, hiding and seek, except you, you choose really teams. Yeah, and you just have to run and holler, you know, they, they got too close, you kept quiet, but when you're way off, you holler me honky or something, you know, like Let them know, you know, where you're, give them some idea, you know, where to chase you at. We don't know where it comes from, but actually we have this, we have this theory. And the theory is, and the, the theory is that it's the sound of a goose, so you say, me honky, me honky. Mama, oh, that means when somebody gets you playing and they get hold of you and they're mad at you about something in the game and they, you know, try to shake you up a little bit. They want to box with you. <laughs> Mom is like to irritate somebody or pick on somebody, you know. That's, yeah, I give them a noogie. And the word mommic means, well, overcoat slang means to torment and aggravate and pick on, and that's what me and my brother was doing. It's hardship, really. Mama, you get out here in a boat and you get caught in some bad weather. Uh, that can beat you to death in a boat. Ask him. He can tell you that. He ain't near that boat. That's what we call being mama. And ding batter. All right. Does anybody remember how we got the term ding batter here, Ben? It's for foreigners in life. Yeah, it's foreigners. They're the ones you see riding around the road on, in the middle of the road on a bicycle. <laughs> and the, the two of them, you'll see there's a couple. <laughs> And a whole string of cars behind them. They're right in the middle of the road, right down the middle of the road. That's their thing about it. They about summed it up, but that's what it is. Somebody who's uh, ignorant don't know any better. <laughs> no, they're just ignorant. I don't mean they're dumb. They just don't know any damn better. <laughs> a real true blood thing about it, or somebody would see the car track, two car tracks going across the beach, and would go across there in a car <laughs> and think, that he could go where a four-wheel drive or something. That is a real dyed-in-the-wool ding battle. The accent is one thing, but the energy that, that words and phrases and constructions are given is another. 
And uh, to me, one of the most attractive things about our dialect and about any other dialect is the just the overall inflections, the energy that you get a group of people together. Get them outside of a classroom, one islander talking to an islander, the speech rate increases, the brogue becomes more pronounced, and it's just wonderful. Yeah, the longer one-on-one -on -one or something like that is okay, but when three or four of us get together, some people don't even, don't even have any idea what we're saying. I invited some of my college roommates and, and classmates to come home with me one weekend. <clears throat> so we we came down and we went out that night and and got in with some of the local people here, like Phil Steyer and different ones that I grew up with. And so when I got back to the house that night, they said, Kenny, we just can't understand how that takes place. I said, well, what are you talking about? And they said, well, when you're in Greenville, going to college with us, you talk fine. But when you come down and you start mixing with the people you grew up with, we can't understand a word you say. I agree with that. It depends who you're talking to. I try, I try to, sometimes, if we're going to be talking to somebody for a while, I try to slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. I was married, uh, I was married 10 years on the phone, I wasn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said, anyway. <laughs> When you add up all the elements of the Ocracoke brogue, you get a variety of English that's unique, not only for its sound, sentence structure, and unusual words, but especially for its liveliness. Ocracokers are great storytellers, as we hear in this story about a trip to Las Vegas that didn't quite go as planned. <laughs> so every year we go to Atlantic City, there's yeah. anywhere from six to twelve of us, and we always take oysters and put them in our room and cool <laughs> And in our day, you can snack on a few oysters. <laughs> <laughs> so we get a couple of styrofoam coolers and, and put them in there and put ice and newspaper on top of them, wrap them up with duct tape. And uh, we come up, when we get to the airport, we, we say, well, here's some more luggage, you know, we got these here two coolers wrapped up. Here you go to Las Vegas and take a chance to, to, to spend anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars instead of buying a, a, a 15 to 10, 15 dollar cooler. We got these old styrofoam ones like that. Uh -huh. We filled them up with oysters and wrap, and wrap tape around them. David done that, David Rick. I reckon it's two o'clock in the morning, something like that, and uh, and uh, I, I looked at him and shoot, shooting the suitcases, shooting the luggage off his winning wheel, and it shoots off right, right, right hard, you know. So I said, I better get down and catch that. If you don't, it's like, they like a bust. And when we got lost back, <laughs> here come the oysters, here come the luggage, come down, boxes, busted. <laughs> <laughs> and the oysters. This was only three years ago. <laughs> the oysters was all, you know, was all over that belt going around. When I seen them, I got the hell out of them. I got up and walked right I stood like I didn't know. <laughs> going around, around right the belt, and I was trying to get them like that. When I did, everybody that was with me, they scampered. <laughs> and so Rex, you know you can't embarrass him anywhere. He's never met a stranger. Rex. <laughs> and so Rex, he gets out and he starts picking them up. And, <laughs> so so away goes the oysters, they go down there like this, I see them coming back around, I'm like, one day I'm going to put them in. So some lady comes up and hand me this her box, you know, so they come by, and I, I grab about two hands full of them, and away they go again. I said, well, there they go again. <laughs> well, next time they come by, this lady, she, she jumps in there and starts helping me. Everybody else is going to laugh in the meantime. So she jumped in there and helped me. Uh, she said, what are they, clams? <laughs> I said, no, they're oysters. <laughs> And then somebody in the airport goes get one of these here, uh, well, it's funny things like you, uh, I like a clothes back or something. Yeah. And put them in, and within five minutes, as they would go around like this, he had all them tourists, you know, going out with helping him grab them. <laughs> <laughs> I still stood in the background. I didn't even want to know I was will that thing. <laughs> and they kept going by about seven or eight times, so finally I got them all. And I waited for that next bag. Don't mix right in everybody's luggage and everything, all muddy oysters. <laughs> I thought they were going to run us out of our pole. <laughs> and then the other bats never did show up. So I guess, I guess they must have busted somewhere else before they got that far. <laughs> the biggest influence on the development of the Ocracoke Brogue is the geographical isolation of the island. You know, isolation is the key. Uh, when some of the early settlers came here in the 1700s, of course they brought with them, as many other settlers did, 
throughout the country their own particular way of speaking. And, you know, it, it, the question is, what was that? You know, to say that it was English, that doesn't tell us a whole lot. Yeah. The first settlers on Ocracoke were ship pilots and their families. Pilots guided merchant ships through the hazardous chain of barrier islands to mainland ports. As ship traffic increased, so did the population of pilots and their families living in Pilot Town. Pilot Town was later renamed Ocracoke Village. There, there's, there's migration up and down the eastern seaboard, and there's fanning out, say, from Philadelphia, Irish, English, and down in Appalachia, and then there's going and from Tidewater, Virginia, up and down, where there was Irish influence uh, up and down the Outer Banks. The dialect that Ocracokers and other Outer Banks natives speak is similar to that of present-day Eastern England and Southwest England. A lot of people that was, you know, from the United States, they thought I was in West London, you know, and, they, and I, we, matter of fact, I picked a map up real quick, you know, and looked and told them for half the trip that I was from this little town outside of London. They believed it, you know. <laughs> people ask you that if you're English descent or if you're, yeah. you know, Mm -hmm. like that. Like a lot of people ask you, are you Australian? Yeah. I mean, they even asked me that. They even asked me that when I was down, you know, down Carter County. There, talking to people that weren't from the area. Yeah. But I, I don't know what Australians supposed to sound like. But. A lot of people say, "Where are you from, Australia?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm from Australia. <laughs> As with any dialect, the brogue will naturally evolve on its own, and at the same time may become diluted from the influence of a thriving tourist industry. I think it's especially stronger on the younger people because they're more impressionable and they want to be cool. And some of, some of their phrases, they might have drawn a laugh. And, uh, of course, they hear a lot of uh, sayings on MTV, and, and, and of course, which is another major influence in, in the dialect. Well, there's just a lot of new uh, language influence. I mean, this is a big melting pot now. I mean, it was, for a long time, you know, it was pretty elite. You just had your Irish people here, and you had the same, the same uh, brogue for, for hundreds of years. And there's more and more tourists coming in every in the summer, and I guess, but I don't, you know, and you get taught hair in that language, and it blends in. It used to be everybody when they finished school they wanted to leave, mm -hmm. and they would go away to college or go away to work, and they would try to get into somebody else's accent. They tried to. Cover up theirs. I don't believe in that covering up. This is the way we talk on Africa, and this is the way we're always going to talk. It's definitely changed from the old original dialect of the Outer Banks, yeah. When you start filling Oak up with people from Ohio and New York, Philadelphia, Boston, it, it's, got, it's got to change the sun. Will you try to, to maintain that? dialect with your children where you work at it mm -hmm. i would teach them to speak like like i do when i was younger mm -hmm. from rocky cut because it's something that's sacred mm -hmm. it's really the way we talk something that i was special for yeah and i think it's worse for the girls than it is for the boys because the girls are kind of sort of like they can't fish and they can't crab you know and take up a tray like that so they like eventually end up in one of the restaurants or a motel or they're on more of a day-to-day -day basis with the tourists and stuff so i think they're losing it more than a lot of the boys are i got a little kid so he's four weeks old the time he gets grown his accent be what they call ding banish so i would like for him to kind of keep the same accent and heritage like we've had for years and years but there's no way now all this is gone what, what do you think? The only way it can be preserved is you fell or put on tape. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of new people, you know, coming in and everything, and and uh, it's changed a lot in the last few years. In the last uh, 20 years, uh, most of it's been lost. Because of the regular patterning we find in the Ocracoke Brogue and all dialects, linguists have a great respect for language differences. Dialects don't have rules. They're just corrupt English. What would you say now? Oh, well, that would mean everybody has corrupt English. Really? Because everybody has their own separate dialects. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think there's a place for, for all kinds of dialects. You know, I mean, there could be nothing worse in this world if we all spoke the same way. I said, I lost my cap in Barney's Gap. Where do you think I'll find it? He said, teach his hole, God bless me soul, but the rim was torn from riding. <laughs> Talking about my cap, you know. 
So he lost his cat, Barney's Gap. It's a, they're like a slew of water right here. It's called Barney's Gap. So he lost his cat, Barney's Gap. Where do you think he find it? I find it. In Titch's hole, God bless my soul. My friend was torn from around. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah, I don't know.